next uh, topic of our discussion is uh, ta uh, tackling industrial emissions. And for this discussion, we have uh, a nice panel. Uh, we have our colleagues, uh, Professor Martin Trussler, Dr. Bemi Oluleye, uh, Dr. Uh, May Bui, uh, discussing uh, this topic. So uh, if I may ask uh, uh, Martin, uh, Bemi and May to introduce themselves briefly first, then we will get started with the main discussion. So should we, we'll go in order. Good morning, everyone. I'm Professor Martin Trussler from the Chemical Engineering Department here at Imperial. Uh, I'm a specialist in fluid physical properties, which is a very generic area, but much of my research is directed towards energy issues, towards uh, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, uh, and the like. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Let me. Good morning, um, my name is Bemi. I'm a lecturer in the Centre for Environmental Policy. Um, my expertise and my research group tackles industrial decarbonisation, but from a demand side perspective, where we develop bottom up models of the industrial processes and their associated energy systems. So looking at steam generation at different pressure levels and power generation. And with these models, we're able to integrate low carbon technologies or industrial decarbonisation concepts in the bid to create a demand um, on the plans, on several plans in an industrial site or where you have several industrial sites in a cluster. And from there, we have uh, we partnered what are called market potential analysis to look beyond the boundaries of a cluster to several industrial clusters to create a market. And using this framework, we're able to quantify the impact of policies and business model in increasing adoption of industrial decarbonisation concepts in a bid to create demand uh, for these concepts from these bottom-up models. Thank you. May. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mai Bui. I'm a research associate here at Imperial College at the Centre for Environmental Policy. Uh, my background is chemical engineering and, and the work that I do is focused on uh, looking at a technology called carbon capture and storage and applying it to different applications. So uh, looking at the power sector and its role there, industrial um, processes and decarbonising those, uh, and also a technology called greenhouse gas removal. So we've done a lot of work on bioenergy with carbon capture and storage and also this other technology called direct air capture and trying to understand the techno-economic potential of these technologies and also demonstrating them. And so we've done some uh, demonstration uh, testing work in Norway, uh, looking at large scale uh, operation of a carbon capture and storage process and how it works and understand um, how we might operate these things. So looking forward to the panel. Thank you, my. And just to introduce myself, uh, uh, so I'm a professor of environmental engineering uh, in the Department of Earth Science and Engineering, as well as being one of the two co-directors of Energy Futures Lab. And my own research focuses on risk assessment and life cycle assessment of engineering uh, systems. And I have worked uh, for many years on uh, industrial uh, systems and particularly the energy aspects of this. Uh, so uh, to start with, I would like to explain to you why we uh, take a special view about tackling industrial emissions and uh, why this is um, uh, quite important. So if you look on the left hand side of the slide, you will see from a recent report that was published by the International Energy Agency, how the global energy related CO2 emissions uh, vary by sector. Uh, you can see in the yellow in color there, the industrial emissions, which are uh, at 23 percent of uh, the total, uh, while you can see in the cooler colors on the uh, right hand side, uh, power by a different sources, coal, gas and oil uh, at approximately uh, uh, 40 percent. And then we have uh, transport and buildings and in general all other emissions, a smaller fraction. So uh, industry is quite uh, an important uh, uh, part of uh, uh, CO2 emissions and uh, the makeup of the industrial emissions is what you can see in the second um, uh, diagram in the, in the middle of the slide where you can actually see that iron and steel and cement and the chemical industries in the uh, pale green, uh, uh, bluish green and the yellow colors actually uh, make uh, very substantial elements of this. And what we have noticed uh, over time is that, of course, these have been increasing, 
uh, in the very recent uh, years we have seen a decline and we expect and hope that with the sustainable development scenarios these emissions are going to uh, reduce uh, in the future. Uh, nevertheless, they still remain in a very high level and certainly much, much higher than we had in uh, the early 2000s. And besides the fact of them being uh, very substantial, the other interesting characteristic about industrial emissions is that they are distributed. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see an example of a situation that we are facing in the UK. Um, uh, you can see where uh, there are little globals and uh, uh, centers uh, are the regions where we have substantial industrial uh, emissions in the UK uh, sector. And again, it is the uh, refining, the fertilizers, the chemicals, the cement, uh, the iron and steel industries that uh, make up these emissions. And we can see that uh, they are spread around. So actually tackling them requires a quite different approach than we can have in uh, uh, other areas, like for example, emissions reduction in power. Uh, in, in the very uh, recent uh, times, only uh, last month, uh, uh, late in uh, October, the Industrial um, uh, Strategy Challenge Fund has decided that uh, two of these clusters, uh, the one on the right hand side that combines the T side and Humber side and is called the Northern Endurance Partnership, will uh, receive substantial funding from government to reduce industrial emissions. And uh, uh, the same is the case for the High Net Northwest cluster, which is in the Merseyside uh, region. Now, both of these uh, clusters have substantial opportunity for uh, CCS implementation, hydrogen emissions uh, reduction, and uh, my colleagues are going to discuss this and explain how we can achieve this. So, first of all, if I may ask uh, Mai to uh, take the stage and explain to us the role of carbon capture and storage, please. Great. Thank you, Anna. Uh, so that was a very nice introduction into uh, sort of the background of industrial decarbonisation. So uh, I'm going to kind of talk about the role that um, carbon capture and storage in particular could play in uh, the industrial decarbonisation challenge. Uh, so I'm involved with um, Innovate UK at the moment. We're looking at sort of implementing uh, decarbonisation approaches uh, in different parts of the UK for in these locations called industrial clusters. Um, the reason why um, industrial processes are quite emission intensive is that they often rely on fossil fuels. So when you think about these processes that you've got refineries, uh, chemical production, uh, cement and steel production, inherently a lot of some of these processes use fossil fuels. Um, unlike in the power sector, you can kind of use uh, renewable energy to kind of decarbonize the energy grid, whereas with uh, industrial processes, it's a bit more challenging to do to implement renewable energy. And so often uh, carbon capture and storage could be the more uh, economically uh, feasible way to, to do uh, decarbonisation. Uh, and some of these processes like cement and steel have sources of gases that have high concentrations of CO2 uh, in these gases. And so as a result, it means that the cost of capturing that CO2 is quite low. And so this presents a potential economic opportunity here. Um, and then when you're looking at where these plants are located, you can see, as you saw from the diagram that Anna showed, that they tend to be located relatively close together. So if you look in uh, Humberside, for instance, you've got multiple plants that are emitting CO2 that are located in sort of a similar um, close region. And so these clusters uh, represent a good opportunity to implement uh, carbon capture and storage, which is quite an infrastructure heavy type of um, technology where you'll need uh, pipes uh, and storage of CO2. And so this will transport the CO2 and store the CO2, and this is quite capital intensive. But with industrial decarbonisation, because these plants are located close together, you can kind of build all the infrastructure around these, um, these locations. Uh, and a key aspect if you were to do carbon capture and storage is making sure that you capture as much of the CO2 as possible from the gas streams. And so generally, Previously, it was assumed that we would only capture 90% of the CO2, but now we know in the last three years or so that we can feasibly capture 95 or even up to 99% of that CO2. 
from um, the gas sources. And this means that you can then reduce the burden on relying on these greenhouse gas removal technologies. Uh, so when I talk about greenhouse gas removal, this in involves things like uh, bioenergy with uh, carbon capture and storage or direct air capture or even afforestation. Uh, these technologies are a bit more limited in terms of their potential. So we don't want to rely on them too much and there's a bit more uncertainty about the cost. And so that's why um, you want to maximize your capture rate as much as possible so that you reduce that burden. Uh, so there's lots of opportunities here for carbon capture and storage. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll pass on to the next speaker. Thanks. Martin, I think it is. Uh... It is indeed me. So th thank you. And, and, and the, the two previous talks are a, a great segue into uh, what I'm going to speak about, which is the role of hydrogen in industrial decarbonisation. And we've already seen here that a, a large fraction of the CO2 emissions, especially in the UK, uh, are distributed and they're associated with heating and, and, and transport uh, mainly. So in brief, if you look at the built environments and, and how we can decarbonise heat, we have choices. We have electric heat pumps and, and we have hydrogen fired boilers. So we've heard a lot about heat pumps recently. These can work well in uh, commercial domestic situations because the heat required is at quite low temperature and heat pumps are very efficient. So for every joule of electricity you expend, you get three or four joules of heat. So this is wonderful. Hydrogen fired boilers are also known to be entirely feasible and, and uh, several studies have shown uh, conversion of a local distribution system and also domestic and commercial heating equipment to 100% hydrogen is quite achievable. In the transport sector, we're already seeing a rapidly expanding fleet of electric vehicles and we have the potential for using hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Uh, hydrogen looking particularly promising for heavy transport, trucks and trains, uh, where batteries may not be practical. However, we're talking today about industrial decarbonisation much of which is associated with industrial heat. So in contrast to space heating and the like, uh, many industrial processes require high temperature heat, which is best provided by combustion of a fuel. So here, hydrogen could be pivotable. pivotal. Sorry. So conversion of industrial furnaces to hydrogen is certainly more complex than converting, let's say, a small boiler. However, projects such as High for Heat have demonstrated that this is a feasible option. In contrast, the heat pumps that may be good in, in other situations have limited utility in industrial situations because of the requirement for high temperature heat. And you really want to avoid direct electrical heating because that only makes sense when you reach a, a largely renewable electricity system. Uh, and even then, uh, a lot of electrical heating may place excessive burdens on the grid. Therefore, there's a clear case for using uh, hydrogen production and distribution to help decarbonize industry. So the slide you can see on your screen here outlines the main components of such a large scale hydrogen infrastructure. In the medium term, we can anticipate that such a network would be fed by a combination of green hydrogen, that's hydrogen produced by water electrolysis powered by renewable electricity, and blue hydrogen produced from natural gas with carbon capture and storage. So these complementary production methods can be integrated into a new high pressure hydrogen distribution system connecting the key industrial hubs that Anna showed us around the UK. New pipelines may be required to facilitate these, although existing low pressure polyethylene pipe can be repurposed from natural gas to hydrogen for the low pressure part of the distribution system. So blue hydrogen, as you know, produces a waste stream of CO2 and also several key industrial processes intrinsically produce CO2 irrespective of the fuel which is used to power them. Therefore, in the hydrogen infrastructure, we also need a CO2 capture, transportation and storage capability to serve industrial clusters in which hydrogen is both produced and used. Looking at the diagram there, another key element of a developed hydrogen infrastructure is storage. Compared to the current natural gas system, where line packing provides most of the storage, larger storage capacities are going to be needed for hydrogen. Uh, these reflect the intermittent uh, nature of renewables, which necessitate a larger buffer in the system. The salt caverns and uh, geological storage, for example, in the porous rocks of deep aquifers are options here. 
Now let's turn to research. Many of us advocate learning by doing. This process will refine engineering practice and other technical and non-technical aspects of industrial decarbonization. However, research is also very important and is needed to advance the fundamental understanding uh, in a way that will help drive down costs, minimize environmental impact, and help ensure that we get a safe, effective, and economic uh, uh, process infrastructure. My own area of interest focuses on the stuff that passes through the network you can see here. The gases that are transported, stored, and utilized, and the myriad of fluid systems that are encountered in processes such as hydrogen production, CO2 capture, and underground gas storage. Uh, the properties of fluids are a classical area of research, but the need for sound quantitative understanding here and the existence of significant knowledge gaps has brought the field into sharp focus. Other colleagues specialize in materials, materials for separating gases, membranes, organs, etc., materials of construction, and materials for catalysis. So I'll conclude my, my uh, comments with the observation that the fields of fluid and material properties are one of the key research areas, along with many other things, required to underpin our vision of a decarbonized industrial sector. Thank you, Martin. And um, now I, will, I would like us to think a little bit uh, more about the bigger scale and uh, discuss about supply chain emissions. Uh, so as uh, uh, Martin uh, mentioned, quite a lot of our uh, fuel that is needed to power our industry uh, comes from overseas. Uh, we receive quite a lot of natural gas that may be produced in the North Sea. Uh, we receive natural gas in the UK that is transported uh, from uh, Qatar. We also receive natural gas from Russia and the US uh, via uh, LNG. Now, uh, what we have uh, realized is that uh, actually all these uh, different uh, products, which might be of very similar quality when they reach our source, actually arrive to our source with a very different carbon footprint. And this different carbon footprint, in fact, we can actually quantify. Uh, so we use um, uh, life cycle assessment uh, methods to allow us to evaluate accurately the supply, the supply chain emissions, not only for natural gas, but for any, any commodity or any, any fuel that uh, we need in our industrial uh, uh, production. And uh, uh, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, as an example, how the, a number of different global value chains compare with one another in terms of the CO2 footprint per megajoule of natural gas that is delivered to market. And you can in fact see that uh, we have up to a, a scale, an order of magnitude in scale difference between uh, uh, different sites. That is uh, quite important and, and it is very important because we need to understand how we can actually reduce this. Uh, by looking at the specific uh, processes that uh, uh, are part of the value chain uh, in production, in transport, as well as uh, in power generation downstream uh, when we use uh, these uh, fuels in industry is critical. And uh, in the middle of the diagram, you see two box whisker plots, which actually uh, distinguish uh, the methane emissions from the whole chain. Uh, from the whole chain uh, greenhouse gas emissions that you can see all incorporated uh, for a number of different uh, global value chains that we have studied in collaboration uh, with uh, industry and other international stakeholders here at the college. And you can see that the, the, the methane emissions vary quite uh, substantially and as you know methane is much more potent uh, greenhouse gas uh, than CO2 and it is essential to tackle it. Uh, and, and then on the right hand side, you can see a comparison of how the footprint uh, of uh, uh, natural gas that uh, reaches uh, different markets actually varies. And maybe a little bit of an explanation why in the recent uh, COP26 discussions, we have seen uh, a lot of resistance from uh, Australia uh, to reduce uh, their, uh, uh, to, 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 to improve on their targets. And we have also seen a move uh, in North America. Um, uh, the US president announced that uh, methane is going to be tackled uh, quite substantially, and uh, this is uh, an important priority. 
Um, so when you look at uh, uh, the two different markets that you have with uh, and uh, at the top for Asia with Japan as an example and at the bottom in Europe uh, for a number of uh, European countries, uh, you will uh, notice there in, in red the footprint that we have uh, uh, for methane that is emitted. So in North America, when we produce natural gas, we have 2.4% uh, of the produced methane to be emitted, which is a substantial, substantial emission that is very critical and, and the reason uh, for the promises. And what I would like to say from this is that we know that products that are being manufactured at different locations in the world have a very different embodied footprint and we need to be able to uh, reflect this different footprint in the price and currently this is something that is not happening and in our opinion here at the college uh, we think that we must challenge this and change that and provide the tools and the evidence how uh, to do this to policymakers. So now I will pass on the button to Bemi to talk a little bit more about uh, the policy more specifically. Bemi. Uh, thank you, Anna. So um, I'll be talking about, I'll be sharing some insights from my research that addresses one of the elephants in the room when it comes to industrial decarbonisation, and that is how do you accelerate adoption of these concepts to decarbonise industry, whether it's carbon capture and storage or switching to alternative fuels. Um, and there are three pillars. Uh, there are three ways to, to accelerate uh, adoption of this concept. One of them is based on a hierarchical combination of concepts. There are various concepts of the carbonized industry, and each of these concepts is a pool of technologies and fuels, uh, beginning from minimum demand for material and energy to making sure that the system that provides that raw material and energy or converts that raw material to a finished product is highly efficient to switch into alternative fuels like hydrogen, whether it's green or blue, biogas, biomethane, synthetic fuels, switching, of course, technologies, for example, moving from combustion to electrochemistry to carbon capture and storage and to greenhouse gas removal and we, we developed a hypothesis that was like is there a hierarchy to combination of these concepts and that's because any industrial cluster or any industrial site is going to require more than one concept and what we've seen is if you start from minimum demand for energy as shown in the first diagram it is possible to get at least 20% reduction in cost for each of the layers of this concept and steeper reduction in CO2 emission. This we applied to uh, a German um, industrial cluster that is built around intermediate production of high value polymers. And uh, for this cluster, we're able to get data for the processes and the associated steam system, steam and power system. And the CO2 emissions from that was about 0 0.2 uh, million tonnes of CO2 per year. So we saw a reduction in cost from integrating, from following this hierarchical combination of concepts, basically saying, why don't we minimize demand for energy and raw materials from the processes, make sure the supply system is efficient before switching to alternative fuels or capturing. CO2. The second, um, the second thing I'll be sharing on how to accelerate adoption of industrial decarbonisation concept is a combination of policies. Uh, for this, we looked at the UK's chemical sector uh, because the UK chemical sector currently uses hydrogen and we're very much focused on switching uh, from natural gas to hydrogen for the UK chemical sector focused on the devices that provide heating at different temperatures and electricity to the processes in this sector. And the devices we considered all industrial boilers and CHP were about 700 and something in the UK. Um, and the total ideal demand for hydrogen was about 22.8 thera hour. So we'll build a superstructure of these um, of these technologies that make up the market and found and we're trying to look at how do we accelerate adoption from where we are, which is zero. None of these devices are currently on hydrogen except for those that have been demonstrated uh, to 100% adoption of hydrogen and how the interplay of policies affect this. So looking at market based instruments like uh, a disincentive like carbon tax and an incentive similar to a renewable heat incentive where there is a payment for every clean uh, heat generated from hydrogen 
hydrogen or a payment for every clean electricity generated from hydrogen using the existing uh, systems. And what we saw is if a carbon tax is the only uh, policy incentive to to support a change, it's more expensive. But when you have a combination of policies, so an incentive uh, like a heat incentive and a disincentive like a carbon tax, it could lead to about 33% reduction in the cumulative cost of the transition. So not just for policymakers, but also for industry. But what we also saw that was important is the switch from blue to green hydrogen uh, by this sector. So today, blue hydrogen is, is cheaper than green hydrogen, but green hydrogen has more potential for cost reduction and that's because the technology is less mature than uh, blue hydrogen so the learning is higher and we saw that after about a demand of seven terawatt hour the devices in this sector will switch their demand from green from blue to green hydrogen which is depicted by the green bar so what to take from this second diagram is a combination of policies required to accelerate uptake the third thing to accelerate adoption of these industrial decarbonization concepts is a combination of policies and demand side business models. Now, policy support uh, will change with time depending on governments, um, but demand side business models are how industry how a site or a plan defines the value they are generating or how they define their competitive strategy. And we looked for this uh, third highlight, we looked at CCS integration in integrated iron and steel plants globally. So we looked all over the world, there are about 400 integrated iron and steel plants, and then we modeled the market around these integrated iron and steel plants, and they're located in about 38 countries. And in each of these countries, there are, you know, talks of policies to support CCS, such as uh, a carbon tax grant. And we looked at, OK, where we are today uh, in terms of, so if CCS was to be integrated in all these plans, and the basis for this is the size of a market can drive adoption of technologies if demand is high. So, I mean, today, uh, adoption of CCS will probably be zero be, uh, without policy support. But if you look at the existing interventions in each of these countries, we saw that we could only guarantee a market share of about 3.6% globally uh, for CCS. And what we did again was to use to reformulate the interventions in these countries to see and the business models offering around CCS CCS to see how to increase the adoption and then we're able to increase the adoption to about 63%. Of course, we didn't look at the 99% uh, capture rate. We looked at 63% capture rate because that's the that has been demonstrated in, in most countries uh, and, 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 and the cost for these uh, capture was about 87.9. Hopefully with 99% capture rate, we'll see an increase in adoption and a lower requirement uh, for policy. So what, what I can say in summary is in order to accelerate adoption of industrial decarbonization, and concept, one of the things to look at is how these technological innovations are combined on the site. There's a hierarchy to it. Um, also in how policies are also combined to create a policy framework, but also how uh, policies can be combined with business models. Uh, a lot of the talk on policy support in the UK for industrial decarbonization is very much focused on the technology or the infrastructure. Um, I think one, one thing we're missing out on is actually providing incentives for the industrial sites or clusters to try out new business models because new business models will support the rapid um, integration of these industrial decarbonization concepts. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Bemi and everybody for this. Uh, we already have a few uh, questions in the chat and we are going to try to address them. If you uh, would like to like them, please like them. So we uh, at the moment we have a few, but uh, uh, as you add more questions, we will consider them. So uh, I think that the first question I will uh, uh, direct towards um, uh, Mai. Uh, so we have this question about uh, 95 to 99 percent CCS uh, rate sounding fantastic. Uh, so can you tell us how how this has been tested or implemented, please, Mai? Uh, yep. So I, I was referring to you know post combustion capture technologies, but you know people who work on other capture technologies are also trying to hit that 95 percent capture rate as well. And so now that is becoming you know the 
gold standard for carbon capture technologies and that that is the goal is to try to maximize but for post combustion capture it's definitely quite feasible so we've we've done this in uh, demonstration scale testing um, in TCM Mongstad and so you know we've done this on sort of natural gas type of systems in in the US they've looked at coal fired power plant flue gases and it's very much uh, you know quite technically feasible you, you just kind of operate um, the plant in a certain way so you might have you know certain higher flow rates or, or certain things uh, like changing temperatures and things and you can get 95 up to 99 percent without any issues really from a technical perspective excellent thank you my now the this the second question i was going to pick on is uh, on the one that uh, refers to the cost of ccs which uh, bemi touched a little bit upon already so Alex Lagakos is asking uh, for a cost uh, indication which uh, BEMI has uh, provided. Was it $79 uh, US dollars per ton BEMI? If I, um... the, the cost is very much dependent on the capture rate. So the capture rate I used in my case it was 63% and the cost was about £88 uh, pound per ton of, of CO2. So so I, I think at a higher capture rate, um, the cost would probably be higher. Um, May I can confirm or it could well be lower if, if there are a lot of technological um, innovations. I think the question was like at what project scale does CCS make more financial sense than than switching to, to green hydrogen? Um, at the moment today, uh, CCS makes more financial sense than switching to green hydrogen because green hydrogen is more expensive for the same use. But in the future, I think in the future we're looking at from 2035, uh, green hydrogen could be competitive for CCS for the same use because there are other uses of CCS that you can't use hydrogen or uh, green hydrogen for. So green hydrogen will definitely be competitive um, in the future. I, I will I will target this to Martin, but before before I do to, to talk us talk us uh, through the the hydrogen uh, comparison, uh, I I would say that uh, in the recent report uh, from IA published in 2020, uh, the power generation and uh, cement and iron and steel were all under 100 US dollars per ton, uh, as compared to direct air capture, which was uh, something like if I recall correctly from 130 up to 340 300. Uh, $30 uh, per ton and if we contrast this uh, with uh, hydrogen production from uh, steam methane reforming which is somewhere in the range of 50 to 75 80 uh, dollars uh, per ton we can actually see how the different technologies uh, 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 do compare uh, natural gas processing which is the area where co2 capture is currently practiced at the industrial scale obviously it's much cheaper in something like 20 to 30 dollars per ton. Uh, but I think uh, Martin will probably uh, be able to tell us uh, a little bit more about the financial sense of switching between the hydrogen and CCS. Well, what I was going to comment on actually first was to pick up from my comments. And I, I think uh, when we look at steam methane reforming or autothermal reforming, those processes also can be operated at very high capture rates. On the other hand, we need to keep in mind if we're using natural gas as the feedstock to look at the CO2 emissions from the entire supply chain. And the studies, uh, and, and I should say techno-economics is not really my area, but the studies have, have been done on this, show that there are actually significant upstream uh, emissions. So this is something that we definitely need to tackle, the methane emissions. And also there's the question you know, with hydrogen, is it better for us to ship methane from the other side of the globe and make hydrogen here in the UK or should we make the hydrogen in Australia or Indonesia or Qatar and ship the hydrogen? I think that the jury is still out on that. This is a very important uh, thing for us to be looking at. Excellent, yes, absolutely. Um, and um, uh, this uh, relates to the question that Abbas had about uh, ways to produce hydrogen and the supply uh, through the network and the cost, uh, whether they are uh, comparable. Um, okay, so um, uh, can we say about uh, uh, something about how promising it is to use hydrogen in the different industry sectors uh, that we have here in the UK? Can we have a little debate about that? Who, who would offer to have a first go? Baby, do you want to, to, to attempt this? Um, so, so 
I, I look at switching to, to hydrogen in two ways in the industrial sector. One is for processing um, that currently there. So in the processing, um, in the production process, the second is in the industrial energy system. Um, I mean, the industrial energy system is a low hanging fruit when it comes to switching uh, to hydrogen or when it comes to decarbonization of industry. And what we, if we see the breakdown of emissions from the process and the industrial energy system, we see combustion emissions are responsible for over 40% of industrial CO2 emissions going to as high as 60% in the chemicals and petrochemical industry. So I think hydrogen has a huge role to play um, in, in, in decarbonizing the industrial sector. Um, I see it has a huge potential um, and, and I see switching to hydrogen as, as something that can be done, something that is feasible and that's because the energy intensive sectors, most of these uh, subsectors currently use hydrogen so they understand um, how to use hydrogen. So I'm, I'm a big supporter of hydrogen. The only thing that um, makes me worry is the balance of green and blue hydrogen because uh, there's no point creating a, 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 an infrastructure for blue hydrogen if the future is going to look like green hydrogen or in other words, how do we formulate a, a regulation to make sure that the infrastructure for blue hydrogen does not become obsolete when the market switches to green hydrogen because green hydrogen is something that can be produced in a distributed way. It doesn't have to be centralized. Um, electrolyzers can be located close to where they are needed. Um, I, I guess the intermittency, yeah. of course, uh, it's likely that we'll need elements of blue hydrogen uh, for, for a long time because of the, the probably impossibility of having enough buffer storage capacity to see you through extended periods where renewable electricity is in short supply. So in my opinion, we're, we're going to need blue hydrogen for a substantial period of time. Yeah, we, we also need the, the, the technology proof uh, as well, because uh, of course we can produce uh, hydrogen, but uh, until now the amounts that are being handled are relatively small as compared to the amounts that would be necessary to operate with a reliable feedstock, large, large industrial processes that consume vast amounts of energy. And I think the scalability of the, of the hydrogen production and utilization in industry is also something that needs to, that the jury is still out on that how how uh, quickly it can be done and considering the safety issues as well in clusters that have complex complex uh, facilities uh, closely collocated infrastructure and uh, often reasonably close to um, uh, big uh, cities big cities and uh, uh, facilities that uh, the general public may use yeah, I think the hydrogen will do well at sort of um, decarbonizing the heat requirements for industrial processes, but th there are inherent carbon um, requirements in some of these processes, like uh, for steel production, you know, the coking coal that's used, for instance, and that that's going to be much harder to kind of deal with. And so other opportunities could be looking at, you know, biomass alternatives, which might be much more lower carbon intensity, uh, but these are still also quite untested and, and they're kind of more uh, theoretical at the moment. Uh, but I, I think that we'll have to kind of explore other alternatives as well, and not just using hydrogen, but you know, if we were to reach net zero uh, as the target that the UK has set themselves, we got we have to kind of really analyze all the potential carbon sources and trying to think about the options and solutions for each of those uh, different streams. Uh, thank you, Mai. Now I, I see uh, Yvette Stevens has put an interesting uh, question in the chat for us, uh, which uh, all of us can reflect. Uh, uh, regarding the short time frame for reaching the 1.5 degree target, uh, how optimistic do we feel uh, that industries would conform in time to reach this uh, target uh, in the future? Um, can we focus specifically on the in the UK industry to start with, but also discuss a little bit more generally uh, uh, in the future? Would Martin want to take a first uh, uh, cut? Okay, I, I think the answer to this is, is about feelings rather than about facts. Uh, the facts will, will be whatever they are. I, I'm a little bit pessimistic. Um, we are making a lot of the right noises in the UK and when we are, we're getting on with some things, we may even be a bit of a leader. Uh, 
but I'm not especially optimistic that we're going to get things done. I mean, it's going to be the 11th hour and the cost will be higher. And you know, I just feel this is how humans behave. So optimistic that we won't destroy the planet completely, but uh, you know, a little pessimistic about us doing the right things right now. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Mai, do you want to have uh, your, your feelings? I think I'm a bit more optimistic <laughs> than mine. Uh, so I, I feel at least in the UK, there is the right signals that are happening. And so, you know, from government, they, they have kind of set out, you know, funding that's encouraged, you know, support also from the private sector. So if you look at, you know, all the people kind of banding together with the industrial decarbonisation challenge and, you know, they've set themselves fairly ambitious targets of, you know, doing a net zero cluster by 2030, for instance. And so if we can kind of at least get one cluster decarbonised, that will then provide, you know, an example of here it can be done, then, you know, hopefully around the world people will start doing industrial decarbonisation because we can kind of show, you know, a key example of it being done uh, well, I guess. So the UK in some ways is leading the way in that effort. And so hopefully, you know, people will kind of take that momentum and go forward with this. Uh, thank you, my uh, Bemi. All right, so um, if I may answer this question, building on learnings from technology innovation, so we have less than 29 years to 2050. So that means that all concepts of technologies to support industrial decarbonisation um, should be commercialised by today, because if you look at the technology innovation circle, it takes about 33 years to go from demonstration of a technology to market skill commercialization. Um, I mean, the number was lower for combined circled gas turbines in the power industry, and that's because there was a demand for gas. There was a switch um, to gas in that period, so it took only five years. So I'm a bit, I am confident that it is possible for us to um, get to the net zero industry by 2050 if we combine a supply side decarbonization of industry so the building the infrastructure together with the demand side which is creating a demand pool uh, for this concept so we can shorten that time from demonstration to deployment to full-scale commercialization of this project because globally there is a buzz that has been created for clean industry um, plants around the world are talking about an entire Internal carbon price um, anticipating an external carbon price. So the buzz globally is 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 possible to to sustain or to achieve that ambition. It's a it's a big ambition, I would say, uh, but I also think it, it is possible if if we if we play if we do it the right way. Mm. Okay, so and, and then maybe maybe it has to be my take on this. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I have worked in CCS for about 25 years, and I will take my my uh, my my thoughts are related to that. So uh, I re I recall that in the early days uh, of the industry, we were saying that we needed proof and we needed pilot sites. Then the pilot sites uh, happened, the testing happened. Uh, we I don't think that we have uncertainty on the technology anymore. That, that, that does not exist. I think that, uh, in my view, the, the problem is the cost and the policy instruments. And it's not, a, uh, it's not a, 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 an issue that stems from the government not having very stringent regulations that will force this, but it's stemming from the fact that actually our whole economy needs to be modified. My apologies for the noise outside the Royal School of Mines. Um, that the whole economy will have to be modified if something like what I was uh, uh, suggesting occurs, like we put a price on carbon that crosses boundaries and when we manufacture products, if they have been produced uh, using high carbon, uh, uh, high carbon uh, carriers, uh, then they should be a lot more expensive because this will mean that, that eventually the consumer will have to pay and the consumers are not in the developing countries or in China where the products are being manufactured. The consumers are in the northern hemisphere in the richer part of the world where we are not ready yet to pay for the price. So I think that it's not a technological barrier, it's a cost barrier and uh, governments are very hesitant to implement the policies that will make this happen because this is going to mean huge change in society. 
that uh, us normal people might not be very happy with and, and would risk their, their position. So I think it's more a political issue. Um, and uh, I don't have a solution. I think that uh, in academia, in places like Imperial College, uh, we have outstanding research in all the different subject areas in energy efficiency, in CCS, in hydrogen production and use, in the chemistry and the materials that are needed to uh, uh, enable these uh, technologies. And uh, um, we just uh, need to see that society actually demands that this happens. And when it happens, that happens, I think there will be no barriers. Martin, you, just, you, yeah, just comment briefly. I mean, it's interesting. We, we, we all agree on the technical feasibility of decarbonizing industry. And for the most part, we have a pretty good idea of, of what it will cost uh, and what the risks are. And it, it's actually surprisingly well quantified. Uh, and what we need in, in many ways is to incentivize industry and business to put these things into action, because as soon as it you know, becomes profitable for business to tackle these problems, if you can make money out of it, the companies will be falling over themselves to change the business model. You know, they'll be very quick to recognize that opportunity and it's, it's that incentivizing it's more than just business and industries it's the whole of society, but incentivizing to make the right things happen that we probably need to be addressing as a high priority. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Like uh, in Norway with the carbon tax uh, had actu has actually encouraged the industry to capture the CO2 and uh, uh, store it underground very successfully for so many years. Um, um, but we have not seen this happening in other parts of, of the world. and. And CO2 capture and transport has happened again for profit in North America for EOR activities. Of course, with uh, a negative overall CO2 footprint, we have to recognize. But it's not a technical barrier, it's an economic barrier that we have to get over. Right, I wonder if you have any further uh, remarks you would like to make, any of, our, of the panelists? I think I'd like to just also recognize that, you know, companies are also voluntarily, you know, announcing things that, you know, there'll be net zero and and that's kind of there's this voluntary market that's kind of being created with this attachment of this net zero um, sort of label. And hopefully that will, you know, they actually follow through <laughs> with these ambitions and commitments. But it, it's now created this sort of voluntary market for, you know, CO2 removal offsets, which, you know, we never thought that would kind of happen but now people are voluntarily paying uh, to offset emissions and so maybe the, there is some hope that you know if this is a sustainable model that will kind of then generate sort of demand to try to you know implement decarbonization efforts within their company so then they, they then reduce the cost of paying for offsets you know maybe it all kind of fits together somehow but you know there's the policy side but I feel that you know there's a voluntary side as well that kind of might work together to kind of meet this net zero target eventually. Uh, very good point, very good point. And uh, we also are familiar with uh, discussions on uh, industry uh, getting together uh, to focus on developing science based targets, uh, uh, which uh, are actually uh, uh, quantified and uh, appropriate for uh, their particular industry. Um, and uh, so that is uh, an important um, uh, advancement. And I would say last that uh, something else that is critical in my view is that uh, not all the industries are of the same scale and of the same size. Some of them are a bit more centralized, but some of them like, for example, ceramics or glass, they are a bit more distributed uh, in nature. They are smaller uh, emitters. So actually for them, the challenge is of a different nature and uh, being able to link up with uh, the larger industry that might actually be able to sustain the significant flows of the commodities that need to flow to achieve uh, decarbonization uh, uh, will help to, to meet this objective. Now I have not, I, I'm not sure if I have missed any further questions in the chat. Um, uh, so, uh, So uh, Dennis is saying, uh, looking at uh, the perspective of using hydrogen at source as a source of energy storage uh, 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 
i.e. geological storage of large quantities. How ready is the storage capacity in the UK? And how does it compare to existing CO2 storage capacity? Does anybody want to take that? Or I can comment very briefly. And Martin, you want to? Please. Well, maybe you'd like to comment on geological storage. Uh, and I, I, I was just going to, to briefly mention salt cavern storage, where we have quite good uh, uh, potential in, in, in the UK to, to, to store hydrogen and uh, uh, producing the, or making these salt caverns are not that difficult. So it is something where well, we don't have it sitting there ready to go now, but I think we could create significant amounts of storage. Um, geological storage in other parts of Europe, maybe in the North Sea. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Anna. Yeah, I would, I would say that uh, geological uh, storage of CO2 is reasonably uh, well understood. And we also know from the experience we have had uh, uh, around the world that um, uh, in some countries, uh, onshore storage is a little bit more acceptable. In other places like in Europe, this is not something that we consider palatable. So it will have to be offshore. And um, I would say that the hydrogen storage uh, in geological formations is not as mature uh, as uh, uh, CO2 storage, where we have had uh, large uh, pilots. Uh, uh, definitely, it is an opportunity. But uh, I would say that my sense is um, that uh, hydrogen, if hydrogen can be produced uh, from renewable uh, energy, it might be necessary to have smaller scale storage and then the economics of, of how uh, man-made storage compares to geological storage and uh, the, the related risks are not uh, points that have been resolved yet, uh, I would say. I think that there are studies that give it a good indication that you could get enough storage to um, tide you over fluctuations from day to day in, in renewable um, electricity, but it's very unlikely that you could have seasonal storage. The amount required is just too massive. So this is why I think, in fact, that there'll be a continuing role for uh, for blue hydrogen uh, as, as essentially as the backup. Yeah, indeed. Now, there is a slightly uh, interesting or uh, potentially controversial uh, question in the in the chat. How do we see the future of oil and gas companies, large oil and gas companies uh, who have had their core business in in oil and gas in the future, given the uh, pressure for decarbonizing and mitigating emissions from the industry? Uh, would you like to com would somebody like to comment or? I can take that question as well, but Bemi, if you want to say something. Yeah. I will just comment briefly. Uh, what we've seen with these uh, large oil companies like BPs, most of them are beginning to reinvent their business model. So Total now is known as Total Energies uh, to encompass carbon capture and storage, renewable. In fact, BP uh, BP has a, a, an ammonia project producing ammonia uh, from hydrogen to foreign marine. So we've seen a lot of them diversify their portfolios uh, away from oil and gas to integrate um, the, these, these concepts or to make them future proof. Uh, so I wouldn't cancel out uh, uh, big, big oil companies, but I think uh, they, they've taken the mantle um, to 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 uh, to diversify their portfolio, and actually we need uh, them to to cooperate uh, <laughs> with the decarbonisation um, transition. Because if you look at all industrial parks in the world, they are built around petrochemicals and chemicals. That those were the core as. Um, industries in these industrial parks so yeah. if we get the big guys to you know to to join the the, the decarbonization team uh, hopefully we can begin to see new industrial parks in the future built around bio refineries too yeah so if I, if i may say half a point before we wrap up is to to say that uh, uh, probably we don't want them to break up and sell their assets to smaller companies who will not have a chance to control those emissions so we have to to uh, support them and pressurize them at the same time. And uh, definitely this is what we are doing at the college through the various activities. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank you all very much, uh, uh, Martin, uh, Bemi, Mai, for a very good session and our audience 
for contributing to a very lively discussion. I would like to invite you to join us at the next session and uh, look forward to seeing you as well later this afternoon uh, during the keynote. Thank you very much.